Hello, everyone. This is uh, Marianne, your host. Today is June 23rd, and welcome. Welcome to our Thursday night call with myself, Cynthia Mayer, and again, thank you all for coming. Our Thursday night calls are every other Thursday, and they pertain to the new and full moon astrology and, and actually so much more. We are part of the Diamond Network family, which has calls every Monday through Thursday with the main call on Monday night. Tuesday is Voices from the Alternative World with Sonny and Dale, and Wednesday Wednesday is The Candy Show with Candy and various guests. Thursday nights we alternate with Misty, and all the information is on the site, diamonds with an S forever, 31.blogspot.com. And uh, we're, we're going to have another great call tonight, and we'll be talking about the new moon, and also, of course, we'll be doing a Law of One, and at the end, we will open the call up, if not sooner, for, for sharing. So again, I'm going to just turn this over to Cynthia, but thank you. Thank you all for coming, and I'm actually going to change the mode, Cynthia, one once hold on okay okay cynthia the big news tonight y'all is that jupiter is exactly conjunct the north node um the north node is retrograde jupiter is direct this is just a brief uh conjunction but it's extremely powerful They're conjunct at the place of 17 Virgo, which is fantastic vision. And the news coming in is just that. And I want to um, just reiterate that the north node of any chart is the direction the whole chart is headed. And the north node has been in this place for some time, and will be it moves very slowly. Uh, Jupiter moves a little bit faster. But the um, the fact that Jupiter is square Saturn, and Saturn is at the place of high magic, we need to look at that because this is not a time to identify who you think you are. It really is not. I mean, even if you're a New Age light worker and you know you're one with God and all that, you need to even... Uh, go deeper, broader, wider um, than that because uh, just knowing about it is definitely a good step. It's going through the door, but we have to do it. And if we depend on who we think we are from this lifetime, most of us anyway, we feel helpless. It's like um, Jesus has got to come back in the sky or the ETs or the aliens or the uh, resistance, or the ascended masters, or the galactic center, or the gamma rays. Something has got to happen to uh, rescue us, or save us, or evolve us. And that is not very advisable at this time. What is advisable at this time, in my opinion, is for each and every one of us to um, put aside all lesser identities, and claim our daughtership and sonship with divine being, following the footsteps of Christ. He said we would. He said, all that I do, ye shall do and more. And he said, I and the Father are one. So we're going to do that one way or the other. We're going to do it sooner or later. Uh, This would be a very good time to do it. Um, In other words... Whatever your background, 
uh, whatever you did or didn't do, whoever did or did not approve of you. All that is just lessons to be learned. It's all there for a purpose. It's all good. It all serves a reason. But right now is the time to be heroic, to step up to the plate, to make a difference, and that means going deeper. It means going uh, deeper than just this lifetime and our pros and cons of all that has and has not happened in our lives and what was good and what was bad. It means uh, reconnecting, and I would wager that everybody on this call and probably everybody on the earth has been enlightened in a previous lifetime or we wouldn't have been allowed to come here. And it's time to remember that enlightenment and wage high magic. That's what Saturn is saying. It says to wage high magic. And it's a retrograde planet right now, which means that we do this inside. It's an inside job. Um, it's, It's not so much going out and marching in the streets, although that may be people's inner guidance uh, after having done the inside job. But it's more about going within, finding the kingdom of heaven within, listening to that still small voice, uh, connecting with the Father. It's the Father within that doeth the works. And then do the works. So that's Saturn, and it's square Jupiter. And Jupiter is conjunct the north node. What is Jupiter saying? Now, let's look at what Jupiter is. Jupiter is not retrograde. Jupiter is direct, which means it has to do with the outer world. When things are direct, it has to do with the outer world. When things are retrograde, it has to do with the inner world. And Jupiter is uh, saying exactly what the North Node is saying. And what are they saying? They are talking about fantastic vision. It means go way beyond anything you've ever heard of. In your wildest dreams, connect with the Father within and wage high magic to bring these visions into reality. That's what this means. And if even just a few of us do this, it's going to it's going to um it's going to turn the tide. And I think what all these channelings are saying about all these beings are saying, "Yeah, well, we're here to help, but you have to do it." It's because by taking on physical bodies, um we have certain connections just like when you hook up a computer. We have certain connections to the earth that you get by taking on a physical body here. And just like you have to plug the computer in to get it to work, uh, you have to charge the battery or whatever, um, it can be the most expensive computer in the world. If it doesn't have a source of power, it's not a, it's nothing. And we are hooked up. We are plugged in because we've taken on physical bodies here. Now, we knew we were going to be brainwashed and messed with, and we came in anyway because, in my opinion, we have already attained enlightenment, and we knew that even in a brainwashed state, highly compromised in all kinds of ways, we could still function to do this high magic by finding the kingdom of heaven within and having these amazing visions of the outer world. And what I'm begging everybody tonight is, please don't be logical about this. That would be counterproductive. What I'm asking you to be is to be faithful about this. In other words, in searching one's heart, And asking the question, well, if I really could do high magic and I really could manifest anything in the outer world, and it could be anything, you know, if I had that much power, you know, and I could do anything, what would it be? And that's where the homework lies, is in that question, what would it be? 
And because Saturn is retrograde, it's an inside job to actually do the magic. And because Jupiter is direct, <laughs> you're envisioning the outer world. You're doing magic on the outer world. So what kind of uh, <clears throat> tribe, <clears throat> excuse me, tribe do you want? What kind of a community? What kind of a world? What kind of a solar system? There's all this stuff coming in from everywhere about ETs and wormholes and alternate realities and bases on Mars and bases in the moon and huge spaceships around the sun. So I want to look about look at this for a minute. Talk about a fantastic vision. Okay, well I've been studying astrology since the late sixties. That's a few minutes. And one of the big dealies that I did, you know, thanks I signed up for some of these science channels and these you know, astronomy, uh, you know, newsletters, et cetera. And one of the big deals that I did on Carol's call a few years ago was the fact that NASA et al. were saying, if I remember correctly, I was reading a lot about it, that Earth was uh, originally... Uh, located in what's called the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. Now, the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, as I studied at the time and as I was teaching at the time, um, rotated around the Milky Way Galaxy at a 90-degree angle. In other words, if the Milky Way Galaxy is a round tabletop, the Sagittarius Dwarf goes up above the table, goes down through the table, goes under the table, comes back up through the table, goes over the top of the table. In other words, it's going, uh, it's rotating around the, the Milky Way galaxy um, at a right angle. And the big dealie at the time, and what I was so hyped up about, was that what they were saying is that the Sagittarius Dwarf had been sucked into one of the arms of the Milky Way galaxy spirals called the Sagittarius Arm and was now rotating um, not at a 90-degree angle but with the Milky Way galaxy. It was on the very outer fringes of the Milky Way galaxy. And that was the big deal a few years ago. Well, now, if you dial up a NASA and put in the Earth, what you're going to see is no. What they're saying now is that no, we're not on the outer edge of the Milky Way galaxy. And no, we're not on the Sagittarius arm. Well, then where are we, you might be asking. They're saying we're in the middle between the outer edge and the middle. We're right in the middle. We're halfway into the middle. On the Orion arm, NASA. So there's this brave dude who put up a 12-minute video trying to explain this because he remembered about us being on the outer fringes of the Milky Way galaxy in the Sagittarius arm, and he was trying to make sense of why now NASA is saying, oh, no, we're not on the outer fringes. We're halfway into the middle on the Orion arm. And what he said made very much sense to me. It's what Bruce Lipton, back on the Carol calls, Bruce Lipton used to come on, and what he would do is he would take a DNA sample from somebody, look at it under a microscope, and send part of the DNA miles away with another scientist who had put that under the microscope. And then he would do something, uh, play music or do some emotional thing that would actually change under the microscope the DNA. And what they found was at the exact moment that he did whatever he did to change the DNA under his microscope, the DNA that had been taken miles away did the same thing, miles away. And Rupert Sheldrake wrote a whole huge book on this 
called it morphogenetic fields because they found the same thing happened in Silicon Valley where they were growing um, crystals for computer chips. And the hundredth monkey thing is about the same thing. And in quantum physics, what they talk about, and they have photographed this stuff, right, is that you can have a particle that splits into two, and one particle will zoom off in one direction, the other particle zooms off in another. But if either one of the two particles goes through a change, the other one goes through it too, even though they are way apart. It's just like the DNA. There's this... uh, like they're calling them wormholes or string theory of how can this be that there's this one particle breaks into two, they go way apart, and then a change happens to one of the particles, and at the same time, the other one far away goes through the same change. So now if, and we're just doing fantastic vision here, people, so let's just enjoy the ride, just relax. Let it be a nice fantastic vision that we're enjoying tonight. If the earth split off into two, now wait a minute. Before you go into, ah, no, it couldn't be. Wait a minute. Just wait a minute. First off and foremost, we're having a good time here and we're just imagining, so don't take it too seriously. But secondly, as above, so below. An atom looks just like a solar system. And it is said that man is made in the image and likeness of God. It's called fractals. It's repeating patterns, infinitely small and infinitely large, i.e., your tiny little atoms look just like a solar system, right? Okay. Well, if in quantum physics a particle can break into two particles and go into two different spaces, and still be connected, well then why couldn't Earth? Why couldn't our whole solar system split into two? And one is on the edge of the Milky Way galaxy and the Sagittarius arm, and the other one is halfway into the middle on the Orion arm. Now what this 12-minute video went on to say, and I thought it made good sense, was that those of us who are light workers, whatever you want to make that to mean, but basically those of us who are on the path of love and faith were brought here to this one, to this earth, on the Orion arm halfway in. And the theory is that as we go through our changes here, it's going to automatically manifest on our other particle, which is at the edge of the Milky Way galaxy on the Sagittarius arm. And I think that's pretty brilliant. And it also, as far as the science as we know it right now, absolutely is possible. So then that begs the question, Well, okay, so we're the impasse. We've been brought here. We're on a spiritual path. We're on this earth that's located in a different position on the Orion arm. So what's all this about Orion? Why would being on the Orion arm halfway in be such a big hoopla? Well, my question back would be, okay, well, why are the pyramids of Giza arranged identically to the stars in the Orion uh, nebula? And not only the Great Pyramids of Giza, but the ones in Mexico are, and various other ancient sites, they're all aligned to Orion. Hello? Now, it's not a channel saying that Earth is located on the Orion arm halfway in. It's NASA. And we all have varying reactions to that. But still, it's not just some channeler. It seems to be an official stance. And here's these ancient megalithic sites all 
the Hopi in Arizona, their sites, Egypt along the Nile, the Great Pyramids, those sites, and Mexico, those sites, all mimic on the ground the constellation of Orion, that group of stars. So what's going on here, okay? What is going on here? You've got ancient, ancient, ancient stuff, Orion, Orion, and now you've got modern stuff, Orion, Orion. And I've been reading the myth of Orion, the Greek myth of Orion, and I'm working on it. But uh, it seems that Orion is a masculine energy and that it's human. And that this human uh, made very good friends with a feminine energy that is non-human but is a deific energy, a, a um, an enlightened uh, God-type energy. And then according to the myths, various things happen between Artemis, this goddess, who is uh, the daughter of Zeus, the king of the gods, and Orion, who is a mere human. And Artemis was tricked into killing Orion by her brother Apollo, who was jealous of her close relationship with a mere mortal. Now that's what I'm working on, is what that actually means. But I have a few clues, and I think it has to do with sex. Um, And I think it has to do with the Star of David. The star tetrahedron, where you have one pyramid pointing down and one pyramid pointing up. And they overlay to make the six-pointed star of David, the Magan David, which is a very sacred symbol. And those six points represent in Kabbalah the macrocosm, whereas the five-pointed star of Venus represents the microcosm. In other words, the five-pointed star, the pentagram, represents an enlightened person like Jesus, like you and I are getting to be. And the six-pointed star represents the whole macrocosm, the whole creation being enlightened. So if you had a man who was mortal, that would put him in my way of figuring this out, on the pyramid pointing down. Because the pyramid pointing down with a... Imagine the Star of David now. You've got a pyramid that makes the lowest point. Now that lowest point is matter. It's the most dense uh, frequency of the divine. It's like rocks and earth and water, and emotion. This, the triangle pointing up, which would be the masculine energy, uh, doesn't even touch the earth, if you'll look at the pyramid, I mean at the Star of David. Um, it cuts across before it ever touches the earth. But it's the only one that can go all the way up to the pure being of God to the divine will. So if you had a man, which is the masculine pyramid that is connected with God, falling in love with the female, which is represented by the pyramid pointing down, which is a goddess, to me that is uh, analogous to an enlightened male uh, mating with an enlightened female. In other words, the male has managed to come down all the way into the earth to the most dense level. And the female has managed to go all the way up to the top and unite with the divine. And that, to me, is analogous to um, 
the sacred marriage. It's called the sacred marriage. Um, there are all kinds of names for it, but it's when we become enlightened inside ourselves. In other words, us women, we find the will and the faith and the enlightenment inside of us. In other words, we marry the divine masculine inside of us. So there's a sacred marriage between the divine feminine and masculine. And in a man, it would be a man finding the divine feminine within himself and merging and marrying and uniting with that. And so you get two people, both enlightened, both who have had the sacred marriage within themselves, coming together and falling in love. And then the divine masculine, which is the brother of the divine feminine, which would be a man who had not had the sacred marriage with the divine feminine in himself, according to our analogy here, gets jealous of the man who has and tricks the woman into killing him. That's the story. And killing who? Killing an enlightened man who has had the divine marriage within himself. Where A, a man who has had the divine marriage in himself would never cause harm because he's united within himself with the divine feminine, which by its nature gives birth and nurtures. So he's not going to use his powers to cause harm because he's united with the divine feminine principle. And he's been tricked into death by the masculine principle that has not had that marriage at the hand of the beloved woman who is also enlightened. So what I'm looking at here, what I think the Greeks were trying to tell us through this myth, is that there is no substitute for individual enlightenment. In other words, there's no drug powerful enough, there's no planet out there, you know, magnificent enough, there's no technology that can replace just pure, hardcore enlightenment in the divine masculine. The divine masculine being will and thought, whether it's found in a woman or a man, are in the cosmos. In other words, will and thought has got to unite in sacred tantric sex, with emotion and form. In other words, instead of killing the earth, which is form, instead of traumatizing everybody, which is emotion, for whatever reason, the idea is that will and thought make love, too, and bring into rapture and ecstasy emotion, and form. And as we've learned through CERN and all these other quantum physics things, if you want to govern the quantum field, you do it through emotion. So by the masculine force bringing beautiful emotions, using that force to create beautiful emotions, we are controlling the quantum field of infinite potential on the physical plane, and we can change matter, literally. And I think that's what's happened. And it's our, I'm just follow the story here, whether it's true or not, let's just enjoy it for this, the, the fantasy of it. So if Earth is split into two, with us on the second Earth being on the Orion arm, It's up to us at this time to make sure that the enlightened man who would never use his powers to create harm emotionally or physically is not killed through trickery. So that is what I'm seeing right now, is is our job. We have a job. And the job is to understand the function of our pineal gland and how what we imagine affects the pineal gland. 
The pineal gland is an eye. Just Google it. It's got everything an eye has. And the Bible says if you're when the eye is single, the body is full of light. In other words, instead of imagining what we're hearing in the media or anywhere, let's imagine what we want in our hearts for the whole collective. What kind of world do we want to live in? This is serious stuff. Now, the Bible says, Ye must be as little children to enter the kingdom of God. It says a little child shall leave them. Okay, our job and and my interpretation is that we each have to remember ourselves as little children and remember the kind of world when we were little that we wished we lived in where we didn't have to go to school. Now, maybe some of us had a great school and we loved it, so you wouldn't do that. But you could imagine everybody having a great school. And I don't want to tell you what to imagine. But what I am asking you to do is to go within to when you were a child and remember what kind of world you wanted to live in. Now, when I was a kid, I wanted to play in nature. I wanted my mother and father to be in love and be happy. They put on a facade of being happy and in love, but they weren't having the best of times. And the, the, I had a sister and a brother, and we knew it, and it caused us incredible stress and grief. But they loved us, and they were trying to love each other, and they had faith in God. We'd go to church every Sunday. So, you know, it wasn't totally horrible. But as kids, we wanted them to be in love. We wanted to see Daddy come home and put his arms around Mother and hug her and kiss her and stroke her hair and say, I love you so much. And to see our mother just melt in his arms. And happily, both of them loving us, have a wonderful dinner, a wonderful evening. Instead of him coming home cold and hard, withdrawn, playing solitaire while our mother, you know, and and all dressed up with all her makeup on, in the kitchen making a fabulous dinner, but all alone, no communication between the two of them. I wanted a, a world where not just my mother and father were in love and happy, but my friends. I had friends all up and down the street, and their parents were much worse off than mine. I considered us lucky. I mean, their parents were staying together and, you know, providing a home for the kids, but, man, you walk in their house, oh, my God, the vibes were horrible. And Later I learned there was all this wife swapping going on. Oh, my goodness. But anyway... A world I wanted when I was a kid was for happy families. I wanted to be in nature. I wanted the best education. I mean, that's that's one area I have to hand my daddy a great big hug for. Because, I mean, he was playing classical music. We were listening to it. He would talk to us about very advanced things, even we were, when we were knee-high to a billy goat. And we could we could follow him. I mean, it was wonderful. And my grandfathers on both sides were brilliant men. And, you know, we picked up a lot as kids. And that was wonderful. I loved having high intellect around. So when I go back to being a kid and think, well, what kind of world did I want to live in? You know, there's a lot of nature. There's a lot of people in love, happiness, a lot of wonderful information and education, Um, a lot of fun, you know, just running around having fun, doing creative things. So I go back to being a child, and I think, what kind of a world as a child did I want to live in? And so now that I see that Jupiter's conjunct the North Node, at the place of fantastic vision while squaring Saturn 
at the place of high magic. I'm saying, okay, i got to dig these dreams out of the closet, out of the mothballs, and I need to really look at them and put them in adult terms. So in adult terms, I'm envisioning a world where nature is absolutely glorious. All our technology and all our knowledge and everything we know, we've used it, and the earth is blooming. There's edible plants everywhere. The wildlife is thriving and tame because we love it so much and it can feel it. I walk around the forest and these beautiful pathways that artists have put in out of the love of their heart, and I hear music everywhere. I hear music from strange instruments that people have hung in trees that the wind can play. I hear music from happy people in villages far away. And everywhere I look... I see happiness. The animals are happy. The plants are happy. If I come upon a village or a tribe or a group of people, the kids are happy. The parents are happy. And, man, I'm telling you, this rocks, this vision. And that's the vision I'm holding. And so I'm really asking everybody who's listening to this call to do this as a very serious homework assignment a job to dig up your dreams as a child and in your adult state now at this time in history when emotions govern the quantum field imagine i.e. pineal gland what you imagine stimulates the pineal gland pineal gland has over 20,000 psychoactive chemicals in it 20,000 And all of them are a thousand times stronger than anything in the plant kingdom or the pharmaceutical kingdom. And what you imagine stimulates those chemicals in various combinations to mix according to the frequency of what you imagine. So it's really incumbent upon at least some of us to get it together enough to stop imagining what we don't want. That's what they wanted us to do, was to use our God powers to create what we don't want. So we've got to claim back that power. That's a radical act. And say, look, my imagination is magical. My imagination has terrific ramifications on the quantum field. And by golly, I whatever I have to do, if I have to go sit in nature and not be on the computer for 16 days... I am going to use my imagination to imagine a beautiful world, a beautiful world, a wonderful world. And right now, the way the planets are, to the extent that we do this, you know, maybe it'll just be after work soaking in the hot tub. But instead of, you know, letting everybody else Uh, capture your attention, you know, whether it's a YouTube or people around you. No. You say, look, my attention right now is very important, and I'm putting my attention where I want it to be because that's my job. And, you know, if you're around people that you like, that are uplifting, that are creating beautiful visions, fine, that's part of your job. But if people are, are creating stuff that they don't want, you don't want, nobody wants. Grab your attention back and do this radical thing of just saying, look, my attention is my wealth. And if I'm going to pay attention to something, I'm going to buy something I really want, not something that already doesn't work when you buy it. And then dig out your childhood dreams and brush them off and perfect them with your adult self and imagine that. And there are different pundits on the web. They say if you can hold something for 17 seconds or 17 minutes, whatever, anything's better than nothing. But if you can meditate, say, as you're drifting off to sleep after the kids are in bed, 
and just say, look, enough is enough. I'm going to go to sleep imagining the world as I really want it to be in my deepest heart as a pure magical child. That's all you really have to do. I mean, you can sign up for these cruises to go to Machu Picchu. Uh, You can meet with people and do a drumming circle. All those things work. They're beautiful. But you don't need that. What you need is to grab your attention, grab it, and wrestle it away from whatever is taking it from you and use it to imagine to activate the chemicals in your bloodstream of the frequency of the world that you want to live in, that you want your children to live in. So that is my read uh, tonight. And Marianne, I need to run down and get the chart for the new moon. And it's going to take me a minute um, to do that. because I've got to do some stuff with my equipment down there. So let me turn it over to you and Mayor. Um, if you want to read out the angel messages, I think a really important one would be would be 13 uh, Pisces, because that's where Neptune is. It's part of this T-square, and it's at the place of occult philosophy. And we've read it before, but... Certain things can't be repeated too often. Another important one, if you feel more about it, is the part of fortune. The part of fortune is mineral compound mysticism. There's all this emphasis on fracking, on gold and silver and precious metals, on precious resources of the earth. Um, That's uh, one you can do. Now, another one is... Uranus is still conjunct uh, Sedna at the place of gnomes. There's all this stuff about volcanoes and the earth magma rising in Southern California and the plate shifting. There's all these warnings of these massive, huge things that are going to hit Jerusalem that have been prophesied in Revelations. I know we've read 24 Aries last time. Certain things can't be repeated too often. The vertex... You might want to read that because the vertex is the gateway to higher consciousness, and it's at the place of divine love, 17 Leo. So I'm going to leave it up to you girls. I'll be back as soon as I possibly can with the new moon chart. fantastic vision? Fantastic vision is 17 Virgo. Okay. And what's the second one, did you say, uh You said 13 degrees Pisces. Yeah, uh, 13 Pisces is where Neptune is. It's a a major player. And then the next one you said after that? Um, Probably the next most important one would be the vertex, which is divine love. 17 Leo. Uh, 17 Leo. Okay. I'll be right back. All right. Mary, do you want to read uh, 13 degrees Pisces? Sure. My, uh, please forgive my voice. I it's uh, page 498. Okay. Okay, 498. You said 498? Correct. It's not that okay. long. It's 498. Okay, 13 degrees Pisces, Chloretcha, and I'm going to make sure I'm off of speaker. Here we go. Chloretcha, K-L-O-R-E-C-H-A, the angels of occult philosophy. Please be with us all. Beloved, desire to walk in the footsteps of great teachers and adepts is the calling of every spirit and soul. When time comes for one to break free of cultural and traditional limitations and learn the truth behind the phenomena of miracles, we provide examples, protection and guidance for the seeker to acquire true occult knowledge. Intensity of longing for enlightenment 
divine nostalgia is the driving force motivating the seeker to advance on their quest. There is a compelling emotional memory deeply embedded in each person of union with the one being. In the bedrock of awareness exists eternally a sense of what it felt like to be in that incredible, indescribable state of bliss. This nostalgia calls the seeker not to be satisfied with less than who they really are. Divine nostalgia is guiding is a guiding compass, stirring each person to push forward on their path. We look for this intense yearning as a sign that one is ready to be initiated into the performing of miracles. If it is present, it makes our job much easier. We can provide for them to be directly taught by an adept, or if more appropriate, for us to help them procure books for private study. This is a time for people to advance in their own empowerment. It is not enough to admire those who have gone before. It is necessary to tread in their footsteps becoming accomplished, doing what they did. When a child of God gazes on any situation and wishes to bring healing and joy to it, the skills, understanding, and proficiency for doing so must be in place. Have faith. Florecha. The angels of occult philosophy. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um you know, when Cynthia was talking about visualizing what we want, and also it just occurred to me when Mary was reading this, um, and actually the the last sentence, but um, and with the the tests with the DNA or the experiments and of of the same changes happening in different places and. And yeah. this last sentence, and then she yeah. she's saying visualizing. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's acting on faith, basically, and things will come about or the next step That's will come right. about. And it, the sentence says, when a child of God gazes on any situation and wishes to bring healing and joy to it, the skills, understanding, and proficiency for doing so must be in place. And wow. must be in place, but also it builds upon that. And um, just taking wow. that first step um, mm-hmm. just provides more energy for for new for our new world or our our vision to open up. And and um, you know, and it's it your visions will be, get get more creative and. And then things come possible. Things come into the physical world that that are a manifestation of the visions, and it just it just grows. And new ideas come in of of how to how to how to use your abilities. So um, wow, that's I love that. that last sentence. Just like whoa, oh, that was um, perfect. That was just a download from that last sentence. But um, thank you. Yeah, thank thank you. And uh the next reading that we got is uh for the vertex is seventeen degrees Leo, um Adak. The angels of cosmic divine love and please be with us now, Odak. Beloved, divine being is love. Flowing love is the strongest and most powerful of all godly attributes, and love alone transforms all creation by knowing brought about by love. Where love is not, there is stress, a great cause of disease and dysfunction. Love is the remedy. Feelings of cosmic love are the source of all alchemical transmutation. Love 
is the alpha, the beginning of creativity, and love brings the omega, the perfecting of matter. The beginning and the end of heaven comes on earth. When people want to heal the world, it is imperative that they heal their own inner worlds first. Feelings of love heal and greater love is the result of healing. Any imperfection on any level can be transformed through the power of love. Humans are made in the image and likeness of divine being. Divine being is love. When a child of light responds to imperfections within self or others with love, miracles happen. It is true that in the beginning and in the end, all are one in awareness with universal love. However, in the cycles of life between the beginning and the end, an individual believes self to be separate from God. When shrouded in the illusions of separation, a person can do nothing. I of myself can do nothing. It is the Father within that does the work. When one desires alignment with the divine will for the highest good of all, assistance from providence is provided. The angels of cosmic love transform feelings of separation into feelings of loving unity with God and all creation. This transforming love awakens enlightenment and wisdom, spiritualizing will, mind, feelings, and sentences. In the unity of cosmic love, cycles of time are surmounted. All illusions of separation is dispersed. Then can perfect God, in perfect form, manifest in each and every person. In this state, there is no time between asking and receiving. This is an ultimate teaching and ultimate healing. This is heaven on earth. Through the virtues of the letters of our name, we teach people the power of flowing cosmic love to transform the world. We, the angels of flowing feelings of cosmic divine love, were with you as you entered incarnation. We surround you. We surrounded you in your prenatal development. We rejoiced when you took your first breath as an infant. We are with you as you grow in spiritual perfection. We are in rapture as you experience the exalted state of oneness with divine being. And this is Odak, O-D-A, O-D-A-C, the angels of com- cosmic divine love. And thank you. Um, this, uh, as I was reading, um, I was just going back to uh, one of um, Matt Kahn's main teachings is uh, to say, I love you to yourself and uh, to bring that energy of divine love uh, into yourself because you are breathing divine energy in and uh, you are you are saying it to yourself and to your body and to your soul and it it does make a difference and he's suggesting to do it at least 20 minutes a day or as much as you can so I was wondering if Cynthia's back or if anybody else has anything to say. Cynthia, are you back yet? Yeah, I'm back, but let's see if there's somebody that wants to share. Okay, I'm going to open the call up here. Okay, um, just anybody who has a comment or wants to come in, just star six and uh, come on in. I have a quick question. This is Pat. I I got a little bit corn fused <laughs> when Cynthia was describing the images, you know, of the six pointed star and the pyramid pointing up and the pyramid pointing down. 
I got confused as to which was which. Which one was she calling the feminine and which one she was calling the masculine? Could you clarify? Oh, easily and happily. I love it. <laughs> this is one of my favorite subjects. I meditate on this symbol. I've, I've meditated on it for decades. Um, basically, the Star of David represents um, what uh, Drumlow McKelvick has talked about for a very, very long time, which is the Merkaba. It is a star tetrahedron. It's um, made of a four-sided pyramid pointing up and a four-sided pyramid pointing down. And if you just think of it on a flat surface, um, the one pointing down is female, the one pointing up is male. And in all alchemy, in all of the ancient teachings, male is electric and explosive. It goes out. It's will and it's thought. And female is magnetic. It pulls in like a a vagina pulling in um, a phallus. It pulls in. It is emotion and it is form. And those are fire, air, water, and earth. Will is fire. Uh, Mind and thought is air. Those are electric. Those are male. That's a, a pyramid pointing up. Emotion and and form this physical world emotion is water the physical world is earth fire air water and earth the four living creatures before the throne of god okay i'm slow but i get there eventually <laughs> oh listen oh that brings up my latest discovery and i wanted to talk about the third strand of dna um dna is like um a storage a storage it's an organic storage uh, facility, and we've had this uh, double-strand DNA making a helix, and they say we're going into three strands, and that some of the children being born have three strands, and I can feel my third strand growing. And the bottom line with that is that with two strands, one strand will be one polarity and the other strand will be the other polarity and they communicate back and forth. In other words, uh, the one and the many uh, would be one. Um, you know, uh, that's as clear a, a polarity as you can have, the one and the many. And with the third strand, which I feel growing in me and what I'm experiencing, and it's kind of in the early stages, is that I am aware of both of the polarities of whatever kind you might want to say, but we use the one and the many for the sake of discussion right now. And I see that they both exist all the time, and I'm glad about it. In other words, instead of identifying with being the one all the time, shaving my head, going up into a cave and just renouncing the world and meditating on the one being everywhere instead of identifying only with that or the other extreme where I'm just this this person in a, a confusing world of 7 billion people with all these stars out there and I'm just one of the many, 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 many and living in that world. Uh, with this third strand, what I'm able to see is that I'm the one and the many, and I'm very happy about the whole situation. In other words, I was saying to Mayor earlier this week, and I mean this, I've never met anyone more stupid than I am. But on the other hand, I've never met anyone smarter. And with that third strand, I'm able to see both of them with with tears of love flowing out of my eyes. I'm so glad that I'm stupid because it gives me beginner's mind. It means I wake up each day and live each moment in total wide-eyed wonder because, you know, I don't know if it's going to rain or shine. You know, I don't know if the phone's going to ring or not. Um, You know, I'm just in each moment as it unfolds, wide-eyed and wonderful, I know nothing. And I love that. I love that about life, that beginner's mind, that being in the here and now, a la Eckhart Tolle, and just watching the wonderfulness unfold. And then when I say, but on the other hand, I've never met anybody smarter, um, I love the part of me that knows how to go into meditation 
and just feel myself one with everything. You know, I've spent years at it. And I love that part of me. I mean, you know, I do it, it like early in the morning. I find it's easier for me to wake up uh, before dawn and then as the sun's rising, I do this meditation. I drink my cho tea, I go deep within, and I feel my after working through my negative feelings by loving them, that resolves them. And then I go into this oneness, this joy, where I feel one with God, I feel one with all creation, and it just, you know, it floats my boat. But I love them both. I don't have to go shave my head and always identify with being the oneness, nor do I have to be part of the herd, the crowd, that just feels like I'm just one of seven billion people on this little tiny earth in this huge universe all the time. I don't have to identify all the time with one or the other. What I'm doing with this third strand is I'm identifying with both of them, and I'm delighted. I am just, oh, my God, this is like the greatest thing in the world, that I can be one with everything and I can be I can be clueless. I can be a newborn babe. At the same time, it's delightful. Now I can only imagine what four strands or five or six they say we're going up to twelve. Oh my goodness, I can barely handle three. But anyway, um I really do think that the third strand will be the part of us that is the wormhole, that is the string that connects the two earths and that we're totally delighted in being in both. What do you get, Mayor? Mayor? Hi, can you hear me? I hear you great, yeah. Okay, there I am. Oh, okay. Oh, my goodness. I've just kind of been experiencing alternate realities as you've been talking just um, because I have a youngin in the house who sometimes is like a dragon and the whole house was shaking. And um, so as you were speaking, I agree. I think we just need to love what arises, as Matt Han says, and... um, just love ourselves through it all, even the most difficult feelings where we just were despairing. Um, now we just need to love, love Yeah, ourselves. I'll tell you what I've been love doing. To love each other through it too. Cause yeah, today what my and I have been getting better at this is I'll go inside. I, it's especially easy when you're bummed out, uh, like my. My most likely time to be bummed out every day is in the middle of the afternoon. I don't know why. Because in the morning, I'm just flying high, and then the evening, you know, I'm just in this deep peace. But something about the middle of the afternoon is probably my biorhythms. But if I'm going to get bummed out, it's then. So today when the bummed out time came, instead of eating to avoid the feelings or going to the computer to get my mind off of it, I sat my little self down. And I said, okay, I'm going to go into these bummed out feelings and love them and thank them. And immediately this very old knee-jerk reaction that I've had ever since I was a kid came up of, oh, no, we can't do that. We we can't go into these bummed out feelings. Just, uh-uh, no, uh-uh, no, 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 life and death, no, uh-uh, can't do it. And I said, fine, I can love those feelings too. (laughs) And I just waded into the whole cesspool. Um, I just just sat down and I just gripped the edge of the chair and I said, no matter how bad this gets, I'm going to thank it and love it and uh, just, you know, do the necessary. And sure enough, um, my whole body jerked with terror. And I realized that the bummed out feeling came from a very young age when I literally went into terror. And it was a terror that wasn't just a tree falling on the house or my dog getting run over. It was a terror that I lived with for years. And it was related to 
uh, seeing my mother and father not be happy and finally getting a divorce and seeing the family ripped apart. It was just this sinking feeling of helplessness, of horror, of just giving up, of I can't take it, and this tightening in my gut of I'm going to get through this somehow. You know, I'm going to just keep my eye on the horizon and keep marching forward. Somehow I'll live through this feeling. And so here I am, 67 years old. My parents died in the early 90s. And the feeling is still there and I'm saying, Okay, I'm gonna I'm just gonna let it come up. I'm not gonna fight it down. I'm just gonna let it take over me and I'm gonna thank it the whole time. And it went in like a wave. It came over me like a tsunami wave and my whole body jerked. And it was pretty interesting to me because it probably didn't take thirty seconds for it to completely heal. And I noticed, uh, this was actually, I started doing this a few days ago, and I noticed the next day when it came back, it was much less, almost unnoticeable. And then when I did the exercise again, um, the next day, which was today, it was almost not even there. And so I'm quickly resolving um, an emotion of horror and helplessness, uh, something so horrible I just can't even think about it. Because if I do, I'll give up. You know, I, I have to keep my eye on the goal. I, I can't let it kill me. Uh, that kind of a feeling. And it's pretty much resolved. But to do it, I had to surrender to it, a la not con. I had to just stop fighting it, stop denying it, stop running away from it, and just say, okay, do your do your worst. And when it started flooding in me and flooding over me, I was back in my childhood with that tight stomach, you know, watching day by day, week by week, month by month, as our family fell apart. And um, it was it was horrible. And it is such a relief to not still be fighting that fight. I've been fighting that fight. I mean, it was a childhood thing, and, and here I am, 67 years old. I've been fighting it all these years. And finally, I let it come up, and I loved it. And I took the time with it, and it healed like a wound. It healed. And as it healed, it was pretty amazing because I remembered things that I had forgotten that were good. The horribleness had been so strong that it had kind of taken center stage. But once that was resolved, I remembered wonderful times I had with my father. I remember um, wonderful energies that my father and mother shared in spite of that which didn't work, which is why they probably got married in the first place. There were wonderful energies there. And I, I remembered tenderness, I remembered wonderful times, I remembered love, I remembered forgiveness, I remembered faith, and it's like I realized, yeah, there was a lot of bad that happened to me, and there was a lot of bad that happened to a lot of people in the 50s, a lot of families, but you know what, there was a lot of good too, and I started remembering the good. And, you know, almost tears of joy came through my eyes, and I thought how lucky we were, how lucky we were. Television was new, and we weren't watching it all the time. There was just three channels. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have computers. And we didn't really have very sophisticated toys. You know, our toys were building tree huts. Our toys were digging secret huts in the earth. Our toys were going on long expeditions in the woods and following creeks. And I'm thinking, my God, we were the luckiest of all children. And then this huge gratitude awakens within my heart. And instead of feeling this horror and this terror gripping my stomach that I have to keep fighting year after year after year, all of a sudden I'm just a mush remembering wonderful and beautiful things. 
And think of the change in my emotional state from this tight fear and terror and horror to this melting sentimentality and nostalgia of wonderful, wonderful memories. But I had to go through that darkness to get to those wonderful memories. And that's what I think our job is right now, is that each and every one of us with this Neptune retrograde, these different ones that are retrograde, I wanted to bring that up in that Mars is going direct in just a few days. It's going direct uh, June 29th. That's like less than a week. Now, Mars is going direct at 24 um, Sagittarius, I think it is, which is medical diagnosis. It has been in medical diagnosis uh, when it was direct, and then when it went retrograde, it was still in medical diagnosis, and it's going to stay in medical diagnosis until July the 11th. And on July the 11th, it's going to go into natural medicine. However, even though it has spent 24 days, some direct and some retrograde, in medical diagnosis, it's only going to spend five days in natural medicine, but it will be direct. Now, I think that's pretty amazing. Now, when Mars went retrograde, it went retrograde on April the 18th at the place of the protection for the insane. And if we're not all crazy on this planet, I don't know who is. And we're being totally protected. And when it went retrograde, we had to go turn within, turn within, turn within. Mars is our creative warrior energy. And here it was, not directed outwardly, but within. And we're nuts and we're being protected and we're going within. And for 24 days, we are medically diagnosing ourselves. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm going on 68 years old. And I believe in youth and immortality. And so it's it's a, you know, when the rubber hits the road kind of time for me, you know, do my beliefs bear out? I have to look in the mirror. And Mayor comes over frequently. And Mayor, tell him about me, okay? What do you see? Well, you change. Like, sometimes you um, you look like you're 16. Seriously, you look like you're 16. And then, or 19, you know, one of those ages. And then other times you just change depending on your mood and on your feelings. Amazing. It is amazing. And I see you do the same thing. And Mayor, you're over fifty. <laughs> yeah. I see you do the same thing. And Mayor also believes in youth and immortality and we've read the life and teachings of the Masters of Faris, which is if you're wanting to go into youth and immortality, please do get the first three volumes of the Life and Teachings of the Masters of the Far East by Bard Spaulding. If you'll do that little favor for yourself, you've been good people, you've worked hard, you deserve it. It'll cost you less than a meal. Um, Then you can be on the same page. But anyway, that having been said... I'd like to agree with both of you. Thanks. I've seen both of you change. And, uh, yeah, very young, very vibrant. And um, very old, very old. Yep, I've, I've seen it in one sitting. Yeah, me too. I, I and, think we all do. I think you do too, Marianne. <laughs> yeah, I saw you do it, Marianne. When you were here, you were young almost all the time, but after you and Steve went over to look at the land, you looked really old. <laughs> Seriously, I'm just going to be honest. Yeah. I, but you looked super young when I was over there. <laughs> yeah, but when you were over here most of the time, you could have been easily in your 20s or 30s. I I was getting ready to leave, I guess. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, hitting the road again. But, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's um it's amazing, our bodies and our thoughts. I mean, it's just, and this whole thing about 
what you were doing of um working with your emotions and and bringing love in and loving those emotions that just releases that heavy energy and it affects our body it affects our minds it affects our spirit it affects our life and it changes it and um it 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 um it just lightens things up and it just brings more light into our body so that the outcome um our life is 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 a reflection of that so yeah and and i was speaking to a lady who's got all the phd's and all the background you know the job and everything She's an expert on the body and on water, and she says at a molecular level we're 99% water. And water responds to emotion. Just get the Dr. Emoto information. And what I see with you and, and Mayor and myself is when our emotions are youthful and happy, our bodies look youthful. And when we're worried, when we're bowed down with responsibility, when we're just, you know, toughening up to face another big deal and, you know, it's just trudging through the mire, um, you know, we look really old and tired. And the body and I, just shift immediately, yeah. I, I was going to say, <laughs> uh, vanity, thy name is woman. <laughs> I was thinking when you were saying that, that, okay, here's the deal. If you're going to have your picture taken... Don't have it taken in the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> part of the human body, and, and Cynthia, you probably already know this, but you know that uh, as part of the body's rhythm, uh, we go into detox mode every mid-afternoon. And oh, I didn't know that. Mode every every around two a.m. That's every when I that's when I go through my thing. Yeah, and so you're actually being. What's that thing Elizabeth likes to say? Maximum something, minimum maximum work. efficiency, minimum effort. It's easier to have take a dump <laughs> emotionally or physically in the middle of the afternoon. You'll you'll release more as long as you stay hydrated. You'll release more and you'll come back to life around four or five PM ready for the evening. And I work in nursing homes, I can tell you for a fact. Uh, mid-afternoon, you know, where everybody has plumbing problems anyway, it's in the middle of the afternoon, all of the, the nurses' aides are running out the door wanting to look for another job because all of a sudden everybody on their hall needs to go to the bathroom all at the same time. And they don't know how to bilocate or trilocate or quadrilocate, and Uncle Sam doesn't care. <laughs> so... So it's it's you know it's a very stressful time in any nursing home mid afternoon because of that. But the, it, but it's the good news is knowing that, and I'll tell you another way you can know if you if you've ever had children or you can remember being a kid or, or you ever had a fever like you had a, a, a cold or the flu or something, your fever will spike in the mid afternoon too, and that's because your immune system knows that's the time to detox. So it will jack up your temperature to burn up more bugs to clean you out. Maximum energy, whatever it is, some minimum maximum efficiency, minimum effort. It's it's the elegant way the human body was designed. I and the other it. that coin is, if you want to get old, looking old real fast, be awake at two o'clock in the morning, and you'll wake up looking ten or twenty years older. Wow. So the big thing is to if if to me at least my my uh my the way I try I'm trying to honor my body is to you know go with the flow of how it was designed and uh you know do the best I can to honor those facts and work with them. So no matter where I am, no matter who I'm seeing, if I'm seeing a patient at two o'clock in the afternoon, we're headed to the dining room and we're going to drink some water or something while we talk. <laughs> you know, because cause I, I, I just feel like wow. if, the, if the only thing I can do is, is make sure I stay hydrated, then I'll get through that mid-afternoon okay. 
Pat, so thank the you. The same thing goes for, for, you know, not getting so involved in something I'm doing on the computer that I'm up all night because I suffer for two days afterwards if, I, if I'm not as you know, by by two a.m. and you and the you and Cynthia, I think I've heard you talk about this before. When we're asleep, if we're not in a deep sleep, we can't get to that healing mode place. And we need to be in that place, don't we, to even make melatonin, which is what our pineal gland is all involved with, our little individual stargates, right? What I know, my 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 knowledge of this is very very limited but what i know is that to produce melatonin after sunset you need dim lighting don't have bright lights in your house and minimize looking at bright lights like at this computer screen yeah. and your well, tv please- and you will produce melatonin which by the way is extremely expensive if you buy it oh and, and i'll you- tell you something else don't take a supplement about melatonin that became a fad a while back and what I quickly discovered just by paying attention and doing a lot of applied kinesiology is that if somebody takes a hormone supplement, and, uh, you know, because they think their body needs it or something like that or it's, it's, you know, fashionable, what ends up happening is your body stops making it. Yep. So you're not doing yourselves any favor by taking a supplement without first making every effort you know, to create the environment for your body under which your body can get back to factory business of making your own. That's a, it, And that's true also for, like, the other feel-good hormones like dopamine and serotonin and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, it's beyond stupid that they give people SSRI drugs and then wonder why they become suicidal and homicidal because an SSRI drug is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor drug. It's stops the body from being able to metabolize melatonin, I mean serotonin. So what ends up happening is the body completely stops taking, making serotonin because the factory is getting the information. We got too much product. Slow down on production. Hey, that being said, this is something I wanted to share with everybody. If you want free top-of-the-line supplements, Delivered free to you, custom made to your body. Listen to this. In 1975, one of the founders of Miles Laboratories, Dr. A. H. Free, published his book, Your Analysis and Clinical Laboratory Practice, in which he remarked that not only is urine a sterile body compound, purer than distilled water, but it is now recognized that urine contains literally thousands of compounds. Among the urine constituents mentioned in Dr. Free's treatise, and he's one of the founders of Mal's Laboratories, folks, is a list of nutrients that will knock your socks off. Here's just a few. Alanine, arginine, ascorbic acid, allantoin, amino acids, bicarbonate, biotin, calcium, creatinine, cysteine, DHEA, dopamine, epinephrine, folic acid, glucose, glutamic acid, glycine, inositol, iodine, iron, lysine, magnesium, manganese, melatonin, methionine, nitrogen, ornithine, pantothenic acid, phenylalanine, phosphorus, potassium, proteins, riboflavin, tryptophan, tyrosine, urea, vitamin B6, vitamin B12, zinc, and more. Let me just read a little bit more. This is all free, folks. You just got to get over the dark agenda programming. It says... Stories have been told of individuals who have both lived and died by being trapped in places without food and water for days. Those that survived did so because they drank their own urine. Those that perished did not survive. The ones that died probably could not overcome the misinformed thoughts that urine is a waste product of the body. It's not. It's just a substance the body secretes that contains elements not needed at the time. Despite what you may have been led to believe about urine, pharmaceutical companies have grossed billions of dollars from the sale of drugs made from urine constituents. 
Research is happening every day in labs, attempting to isolate specific elements of urine so they can create new drugs and patent the substances. For instance, Pergonol is a fertility drug made from human urine. 1992 sales of this drug were reported at $855 million, while it cost a patient $1,400 a month to consume in 1992. Urokinase, a urine ingredient, is used in drug form and sold as a miracle blood clot dissolver for unblocking coronary arteries. Urea. Medically proven to be one of the best moisturizers in the world, is packaged in expensive creams and lotions. Take the M out of murine eye drops, and what do you have? Yep, it's made from carbamide, another name for synthetic urea. To get some understanding of how urine can be such a powerful healing substance in and of itself, Let's take a look at how urine therapy has been known to completely eliminate allergies. We read where researchers have discovered that allergic responses are caused by renegade white blood cells that inappropriately attack substances even when they may be no threat to the body. So it is the activity of these renegade white blood cells called antigen receptors that needs to be corrected in order to cure the allergy. In 1982, studies published by Dr. William Linscott in Basic and Clinical Immunology showed that when these antigen receptors, or renegade white blood cells, are reintroduced into the body, the body actually developed antibodies to these antigen receptors, and the antibodies then stopped the allergic response. Realizing that the urine of allergic individuals contained the allergy-causing antigen receptors Researchers thought that to reintroduce the urine back to the allergic individual would mean antibodies would be produced, which would then stop the allergic response. And that is exactly what happens. Allergies have been completely turned around with urine therapy. Using urine in this way to cure the allergy is one form of isopathic treatment. You're using the same substance that is causing the allergy to be reintroduced to the body to have the body manufacture its own antibody to it. If you grasp this point, you may be able to see the ability of this therapy to be used in just about any illness the body may be experience. And why don't you know this stuff? Because nobody makes any money off you knowing about it. I can add one more. That drug Premarin for estrogen replacement therapy. Yep. That's pure horse urine, pregnant horse urine. That's what that is. So, people, you're pissing out a fortune. And, and the top <laughs> medical, you you are. You're flushing it down. And that urine contains your DNA, and it's mixing with the DNA of everybody else in the, uh, you know, the city sewage systems. And I would recommend that there's a better way to use your urine. And that is to get the top, um, very expensive if you can even buy them, the top substances that will heal you free, delivered literally to your door if you'll just put a cup down there and collect it and drink it. And the best urine is in the morning after you sleep. It's the strongest. It has the most because, and here's why. It's because, when, remember I said, at 2 a.m. we go into healing mode? Yep. And on 2 p.m. 2 p.m. in the afternoon, roughly, we go into detox mode, dump mode? Yep. If you, if, you, if, you, if you got anywhere with your healing, okay, everything that you don't need, that's going to be in your morning urine. And that's why most people, if you look, it's going to be a deeper stronger color and odor because everything that's not your original divine blueprint is coming out in your pee. But that doesn't still doesn't make it poison because it's like you said earlier, the body has its own mechanisms for regulating. Uh, it's sort of like a grocery store. Grocery stores nowadays do not have to have trucks coming in on a regular basis, 
you know, every 72 hours with certain stuff to keep their stores, uh, up, you know, their shelves stocked. If something happens, um, they sell more stuff, and so they got empty shelves. They know that they got more coming in the next day or a lot of da 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 da. However, if they know that there's a, a storm coming, they know then to call ahead and lay in an extra supply of water or whatever people buy around here in hurricane safe. So, uh, but the human body has similar mechanisms. And that's why it's so important to me for me to, to pay attention to my body. Yeah, let me just read what you were just saying in this article, because what you just said is right on. It says, urine is not, as many believe, <clears throat> the excess water from food and liquids that goes through the intestines and is ejected from the body as waste. It is much different and much more. When you eat, the food you ingest is eventually broken down in the stomach and intestines into extremely small molecules. These molecules are absorbed into tiny tubules in the intestinal wall and then pass through these tubes into the bloodstream. The blood circulates throughout your body carrying these food molecules and other nutrients along with critical immune defense and regulating elements such as red and white blood cells, antibodies, plasma, microscopic proteins, hormones, enzymes, etc., which are all manufactured at different locations in the body. As the blood circulates, it passes through the liver, where toxins are removed and later excreted from the body in the form of solid waste. Eventually, this now purified clean blood that's left makes its way to the kidneys. When blood enters the kidneys, it is filtered through an immensely complex and intricate system of minute tubules called nephron, through which the blood is literally squeezed at high pressure. This filtering process removes excess amounts of water, salts, and other elements in the blood that your body does not need at the time. These excess elements are collected within the kidney in the form of a purified, sterile, watery solution called urine. Many of the constituents of this filtered, watery solution, or urine, are then reabsorbed by the nephron and delivered back into the bloodstream. The remainder of the urine passes out of the kidneys into the bladder and is then excreted from the body. The function of the kidneys is to keep the various elements in your blood balanced. When your body doesn't need something at a particular time, just what you were saying, it is excreted not because it's toxic or poisonous or bad for the body, but simply because the body does not need that particular element at the time. Medical researchers have discovered that many of the elements of the blood that are found in urine have enormous medicinal value. And when reintroduced to the body, they boost the body's immune defenses and stimulate healing in a way that nothing else does. And just to piggyback on that, I will tell you, um, when I was studying the Rig Veda and the Upanishads and all these ancient teachings of India... Uh, there's a section on immortality, and there was like 360, and I thought that was interesting, uh, different recommendations of what to eat and blah, 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 what to do to go into youth and immortality. But even in these ancient scriptures, it says the only one that is absolutely necessary of all these 360, there's only one that you have to do, and that was urine therapy. And I still say, ew! <laughs> I don't. I've been drinking my urine for so long. Well, good for you, girl, because I still have not gotten over that hump. <laughs> well, I have, and I'm 67, and I like Mir says and like Marianne says, people who know me, when I'm in a, in a high emotional frequency, I look 16. And I looked in my in my mirror the other day, I just stripped down, and I'll tell you what, I have never looked so good. Never. I look better than I've ever looked. Of course, I was in a very high meditative state, so my body looked very, very young. But I'm just saying, um, I am, I, 
this list of ingredients and in urine that I read is small. There are other books that will give you much more detailed lists that are much longer than that. If you had to go out and buy them, you'd be spending thousands. Why flush it down because of brainwashing and mind controlled by greedy uh, magicians who want to suck you dry of all your money as they give you things that are not good for you, charge you enormous amounts of money for it, get you into thinking you're going to age and get sick and die, why not grab your attention back? Stop paying attention to it. Hello? Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. But there's also something else, too, that that I think you're, you're, you're not mentioning that bears mentioning because you're an artist. And you know that an artist has to be creating all the time or they get sick, right? You know that, right? Yeah, you, that, you put it very well. Thank you. <laughs> that creation has to be going on. And I think that's probably why you get uh, that Bruce Lipton and all of that easier than some other people do, because an artist understands the act of creation. And here's the thing. You know, I, I told you I, I, used, I used to know Sai Baba when he was alive, and uh if any if anybody has ever seen pictures of that guy and he had millions of followers in India and he was considered an avatar and had all the 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 um the Siddha powers and had god consciousness and yada 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 well if you ever saw him walking around you know cruising talking to people you'd always see his hand moving in sort of a circular odd little motions i didn't know what it meant i just thought it was, i called it size hand jive well, I just re- learned recently from somebody who apparently studied with him or went over there, and but she knew about this and she uses it now in her practice. Uh, it's a way of um, entering the quantum field and drawing uh, plasma energy into our 3D reality, and that's exactly what an artist does. Like when you pick up a brush or when you go to make a sculpture or when a gardener goes out and starts messing with their plants and stuff, you kind of do things with your hands that I'm thinking now it's, it's, it's like a, it's just a, an unconscious thing that, you know, Sai did consciously. And he could literally manifest anything by his little hand jive. Yeah. And he would do things like, like you know, he somebody kind of come up to him, and he'd look at them, and he'd do his little hand jive, and a, say a ring or a necklace would appear in his hand, and that ring or necklace, you know, later they put it in a lab thing, and in some cases, the ring or the necklace would be the real diamond or the real ruby or the real this or the real that, and in other cases, it would look pretty and it it would be fake. Wow. But, Nobody could ever, nobody had ever proved that he had was any sleight of hand stuff. Wow! But nobody could understand why why some people got the real stuff and other, you know, well, you cheapskate, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Wow! All had to do with see he had God consciousness, so he could see their God consciousness and everything that was appropriate for them. And for some people, it was appropriate to give them the real thing, and and for other people, not so much. They needed they needed to have a value that piece. You know, not for it being of of value in the in the physical world, but of value because he gave it to him. Right. So, but it's all working with that quantum field. And and if anybody's curious, there is this lady. She's na- her name is Julie Renee, and um, she's got a, a an amazing story. But but she uses it in her practice, and I think all artists do, whether they realize it or not. No. And that would access your original divine blueprint. Hey Pat. Yes, ma'am. Uh, are you finished? I didn't. I didn't want to interrupt you. Oh yeah, that's it. Thanks. Um, very interesting of um, what what you're saying about artists and stepping into the divine and creation. When I went to. Uh, the umlauf. Mirror uh, hit star six. <laughs> Mute out. Thanks. <laughs> when I uh, when I went to uh, 
the um, Umlauf Museum. Uh, he has sculptures, but then he also was a painter. And uh, there's parties there now. They, they, their house is uh, there, but they, they both passed away. And um, it's open to the public. And I went in and looked at the paintings. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, I was getting a download of what he was thinking the time that he was doing these paintings. It was like, wow. Yeah, and his sculptures are absolutely beautiful. Um, one of Archangel Michael, of of Jesus, of Mary with child, um, and of children, little children um, running and playing. They're all over his land. And um, wow. there's, there's a stream that runs through it, and People have weddings there. It's absolutely gorgeous, and um, it's just it's used in just one of the highest ways. So, um, but uh, you know, it was just really interesting that I was just tapping into that of what he was thinking when he was painting. It was I don't I don't know much about him, but I got a lot of information about him. It's like whoa. So that's it. You 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 have the artist consciousness, so you can tap into that creativity. It I think it has something to do with what they call synesthesia, What's and that? this is a bit complicated. But um, synesthesia, uh, in psycholo- psychological terms, classic psychology terms, it means you can take information from one sensory s- system and trans transfer it to another sensory system like you can take a sound and turn it into a picture and then that turn that picture turn that into a feeling yada 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 well there's a spiritual adjunct to that that the more evolved a person is or the more they are aware of themselves on these higher realms the more conscious you know as in conscious and subconscious access they have to that realm so they can pull in, uh, like if a person's got a, like a a person's got a really vivid imagination, and they're an artist. When they go in, you know, when they're in that creative mode, their creativity is going to come to them in the form of uh, mental image pictures, and then they just paint what they see. A lot of musicians, like my guitar playing patient that I've got right now, he can't read or write music. But he can play. <laughs> he hears it in his head, and he just goes for it. <laughs> you know that. And to me, that's accessing the quantum field. Right. And if there's a lot of mental image pictures involved, then it can be very confusing for the artist. And I think that's what happened to um, of, uh, Vincent Van Gogh because he was actually diagnosed schizophrenic, I believe, and, you know, he cut off his own ear and all this crazy stuff. Well, I spent a whole day at the Rijksmuseum in um, uh, Amsterdam, and, I mean, I, like, totally baked out. It was like a – I mean, I never took acid, but I would say that probably what I experienced that day was like dropping acid because – I just got it all, like like you're describing with this artist. Mm-hmm. I got it all from Vincent Van Gogh, and it was like, whoo! I was like digesting all of that for for years afterwards, and and I really think that that's what it is. He was so close to the other realms, the higher realms, and he was pulling that in, and it was sort of like, um, you know, if 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 the creation came from the quantum field, from God, you know, from the source, uh, it was, you know, his hand, his brush that was bringing it down into the physical. And he did a pretty darn good job of it, I'd say, because all of his paintings had such rhythm and movement and color. They were very definitely not fourth-dimensional pictures. They were much higher than that, you know, seventh-dimensional probably even. But those things are connected because that's the creative act, and that's where I think the Bible, when Jesus says, ye shall do these things and more, you know, I and the Father are one, you know, when you're when you're engaging in the act of creation, you are consciously mm-hmm. you and the Father being one, and that ain't going to make you 
feel sick and old, that's going to make you, you know, touching that close to creation, that's going to put you back closer to that original divine blueprint. And that's Mm -hmm. what we're all supposed to inherit if we can get our, um, you know, detoxing done, which I don't know anybody that's not going through a lot of crazy-ass detoxing right now. But it's going to be the most intense in the mid-afternoon. Hello? Yeah, Hi, yes. Hi, I just, I'm at work. I stay up till 2 a.m., so I must get old sometimes. But <laughs> I, just, uh, I want to thank you, Cynthia. Rem- keep reminding us of urine therapy every so often. I did it for a month. So I want to challenge everybody, since we're going through these energies, let's do maximum efficiency, minimum effort. And grab a glass, put it in your bathroom. Every time I did it for a month, and then I stopped. So I'm going to do it again. I'm going to start this week. Grab a glass, put it on your by your toilet. I just peed like a swallow or two in there. And as soon as I got done peeing, I swallowed that out and set my glass back on the counter. You know, try it, guys. It's 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 okay. It's really okay. It's really not that bad. In fact, if you get plenty of hydration. Oh, and thank you so much, too, Pat, for sharing about 2 o'clock. That was illuminating for me very much. It's very, very helpful. But, yeah, um, my urine tastes great. If I'm taking too much salt, it'll be a little bit salty. Um, maybe out of 365 days of the year, there may be three or four days when it has a very strange and weird taste to it, and I don't know why. Um, I have, I think it's because my body's going through some kind of weird things during those days, but I drink it anyway. I've noticed that eating asparagus makes it taste weird. But... Um, when I eat beets, it'll turn the color. But generally speaking, um, it, it, it actually, some, I went through this really weird mystical thing, and I mentioned it on the call a few months ago, where my urine was very, very sweet, and I kept smelling flowers everywhere. But Pluto, which is one of the major players right now, which is a very slow, slow, slow planet to move. It has been and is now and will be for some time at the place of plant medicine. Mm. And we're talking about the the medicine that our bodies produce, but Pluto is saying we need to look also to the plant kingdom. And Mayor, I know you've been studying, you've been through this intensive about how plants heal us, and I was wondering if you'd like to read 17 um, Capricorn. Let could me I, add, say, let could me I add, say something first? Yes, please, yes. This is Patty from Spokane. All right. I was suggested the urine therapy. I didn't know how much you're supposed to drink a day. So you could clear that up for me. But I found mm-hmm. another way around it, <laughs> sort of. I put my own urine around it. All right, they gotta go out. I put my own urine around my plants in the garden. Yeah. And I make my boyfriend uh, put his in the um, the sir. So I compost with his. Well, that's so. Anastasia all over the place because those plants will take in your DNA, and ma- just like they do with saliva. Yep. Right. And I they will manufacture what you need. Right. Good. Oh. But I'll start. But I wanted to know how much you drink a day. I drink a lot. The the urine I drink in the morning, I drink a whole glass. Oh, okay. So it won't hurt. Yeah. See, so, I didn't know. Pat, Somebody Pat, suggested Pat, that I should have been doing this. Pat, thank start, you, thank you, thank you. Pat, Pat, start slow. Don't force it and have a bad have a bad experience with it. Just pee a drink or two and swallow a drink or two and then build up small steps, baby steps. Well, see, I mentioned it to a, friend, a sort of friend neighbor, and she made fun of me on the internet about it, and then I was appalled, you know. But well, uh, I have found that those weren't really friends. So thank you, friends. <laughs> thank you, friends. <laughs> Let me also add before you read that piece, because you were, you mentioned beet and asparagus. Yeah. Probably the most healthiest things. You can possibly eat it. And two things, by the way. Uh, Cynthia, I don't know if you remember, but I'm the one that told you about the author of uh, The Secret Teachings of the Masters of the Far East that he lived down the road from me. Yes. 
and I'm the one that told you that that I can with 99% surety say that he said that he inherited those manuscripts from his uncle who was, you know, from back 100 years ago. No, it's him. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I totally got yes on that. But he doesn't put that out because, no. I mean, you know, and that's why I don't put out, you know, what name he goes by now or exactly where he lives. But I also made friends with uh, uh, one of the people that worked with Dr. Mengele in the 1930s in Germany in his anti-aging experiments. And his cocktail for for longevity involves beetroot juice, carrots, apples. Those are the main things. And but the main thing, that singular healthiest thing you can eat is. And guess why? That the very first vegetable Monsanto went after to make GMO was sugar beets. Yeah, beets because they were the healthiest thing out there. Yeah, and when. When you're constipated, beets, beets, I'm telling you, are good. And uh, Y'all, carry on. I need to go see if the dogs are barking at I'll be right juice. back. If you have a juice or carrot juice or raw carrots are good for dreaming. Well, yeah, that goes with- what, I, what, what, what I was told to do was take um, a small beet with its leaves on top, and what I do is I take a beet, I take an apple or a carrot or both, and then I also throw in an organic lemon, and I pulverize that in one of these, you know, really good blenders that will grind up seeds completely. Um, I forget the name of it. It's not Vitamix. There's a better one, but it's less expensive. But anyway, that's the formula that this guy used. This guy has to be over 100 years old now because he was doing this work in his 30s in Germany in the 1930s. And uh, he doesn't look any different today than he did back then. And he's, he went on the lam because I called him out on it. <laughs> and he it scared him. So he, he's kind of gone undercover. So there's, there would be no way to find him. But uh, he that was his, his work. So, I mean, I know that's good stuff. But knowing better isn't always doing better. <laughs> you know, old habits die hard, and I'm not going to blame the cabal for all of it. I, I think that, uh, it, or it's just that it's been so long, and, and I'm real sensitive to smells and tastes and things like that, and I have a really good gag reflex. <laughs> so, But I appreciate bringing all that up, and I'm going, I'm going to work on that because I, I do believe in recycling. Hey, hey, Pat. We can work on Pat's idea. Pat, Pat's idea. Uh, get a big bowl and put some lettuce seeds in it, salad lettuce, and water it with your urine, and then eat that that lettuce with, for salads. You know, that's a good baby step for you. <laughs> well, I could, I could definitely, if I can get a garden going, I can definitely see putting it on the on the garden. Uh, that would make me throw up. <laughs> The other stuff I'll have to work on. <laughs> but asparagus especially is real, real. The reason why it does funny things to the smell and everything is it stimulate, stimulates your kidney function. So asparagus is, if you want to be kind to your kidneys, you know, munching asparagus is the best thing, the best vegetable out there for your kidneys. I wonder if you hey, could put peppermint hey. oil in it and then you wouldn't taste it so bad. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Pat. You're bound to you want to convert me, don't you, Patty? <laughs> well, yeah, and I've got peppermint growing in my garden that a, a lady that's a healer sent me from Minnesota. And I found out those other things. My garlic started looking weird. And no, those are what Marcia sent me from Minnesota, too. They're called crawling onions. And they're actually a Egyptian onion. And they're very healing, too. So I've got all these healing plants, and I'm just looking at them going, I should be using these. <laughs> well, I you know? Well, thank so you I'm guys. going to hey, get hey, a special Pat, blender, I... and I'm going to be trying all kinds of stuff. Be- be- if you be- hear a big belch, it comes from me, okay? <laughs> uh, Pat, it's, it's Marianne. Before you leave, um, i got a question about asparagus. If, if uh, Cat... 
are they is it good for animals too or I would assume, right? Or not? I wouldn't want to say for animals because uh some things yeah. they can handle and some things they can't. Right. But you could probably yeah. find that out by some creative googling. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so okay. I wouldn't want to comment on that cuz I I mean the only thing I know is that uh when I had when I had doggies, I've never had a cat, but uh, at least I've had cats that owned me, but I've never owned a cat. Right. And and the dogs that I had, I always made them people food. Right. And I was just careful to make sure, you know, that the people food I gave them was healthy, but the any any people food for a dog is going to be better than than, you know, Purina dog chow cuz they just put crap in that. Absolutely. Okay, you know? I'll uh I'll Google this, but thank you in regards to the asparagus. Thank you. And I know one you. thing you, that, that you wouldn't give a, an animal, and it's counterintuitive, like I think it's tuna out of a can. That's real bad for them. Yeah. But I don't, I really am no expert at all on that. Well. I just know about beets and asparagus, carrots and apples. And, of course, that means, you know, getting them organic, not GMO. Mm-hmm. And if you can remember your uh, next time we have our call with, in two weeks, if you can look and see what your blender is, <laughs> if you can bring that information, that would be good. Is is it a Ninja blender? I'll I'll tell you in just a second here. Okay. It's right here. I just have to get up. Uh, Nutribullet. Oh, okay, sure. Bad design in the sense that if you don't have that sucker on there just right and you turn it on, your stuff's going to splatter everywhere because instead of, you know, like how most ones, the, the uh, uh, you know, the thing sits on the thing and then the bottom uh, blades, you know, come up into it. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, this thing, it goes just, the, it goes upside down. So if it's not on there exactly right or you're, okay. you're, it's not screwed in exactly right, you'll get splatter everywhere. But other than that, it does work because I also have a Vitamix. It does a much better job of of grinding up all the seeds. Nice, nice. And I don't know where I heard this, but I'll share it anyway just for people to kind of check out. It never occurred to me, but one of the healthiest, oh, I know what it is. I've been looking into the values of seed oils, which led me to seeds, which led me to realize that, One of the healthiest vegetables there are is avocados. Now, who has ever thought of grinding up and eating an avocado seed? Because they're so huge. So, but supposedly, that is one of the healthiest seeds there are. Wow. Well, thank you, Pat. Wow. And you have to try that in your bullet and see if it works. Seeds are the have inside them the seed of life for that plant, they are like um, um, uh, stem cells for humans. And this is what I I, I like, this just popped in my head and I realized, this is the reason why the the, the, uh, reptiles take the little children and eat them. They're going after their stem cells. Mm. And that's why them darn royals all over Europe, you know, live well over 100 years old, most of them. And that's what it is. It has to do with harvesting uh, human stem cells. And I think that's connected up with all of the missing children, too. But, there, see, there's always, to me, no matter how evil there are, there's got to be a logical reason for why they do the things they do. And I think that's what it is. So if we can do the same thing without really harming anybody, you know, yeah. if we if we stick with eating critters that have group souls but not individual souls, okay, that's got to make a difference. And certainly if we're eating um, vegetables and we go after the seeds and recognize that that's like the stem cells mm. of the vegetable plant, that's going to have the original divine blueprint in there. So that's going to be the closest thing to source you can get in the 3D, which means those things should be the healthiest. Am I making any sense? Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, what is it, alfalfa? Uh, 
alfalfa seeds and yeah 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 uh, I mean sprouts sprouts, sprouts. That's it that's sprouts. it and sprouts. and what made what they did to make sprouts uh, like be unattractive if I don't know if anybody remembers but they got they were real real popular back in the 70s and 80s but then all of a sudden they had this big thing about all these alfalfa sprouts getting infected with this or that so stay away from the alfalfa sprouts and then after that you couldn't buy them anymore and I don't know at least around here you can't really buy alfalfa sprouts but sprouting used to be a big thing for a while and now oh, yeah. it's not so much anymore yeah and hi, this is Mayor. I just wanted to chime in and say I just learned how to do it. And I went through an intensive uh, 10-day raw food um, training at the Living Food Institute here in Atlanta. And um, th- it's really easy to sprout. Um, you can get... No. You you have to you don't, isn't it true, uh, Mary? You you have to you have to keep changing your water, or you have to do something. You, you know, have to rinse them in the morning and the evening with alkaline water. There you That's go. All you have to do. And That's you well, all you have to do is keep rinse them. From, well, first you soak them in water for about yeah. eight hours overnight, and then you rinse them in alkaline water in the morning and the evening until they sprout. So it's there. really easy. There are little bags you can get mm-hmm. um, and just hang them anywhere, really, to sprout. And just mm-hmm. remember to rinse them in al- alkaline water. There you go. Yep. Hey, Mayor, we shouldn't waste what I'm you learned. I, I wish you could. Uh, I, I'll talk to Misty if she's not on. But maybe Misty can have you as a guest on her show uh-huh. and tell and we'll you can tell us all about see. what you learned. Uh-huh. Yeah, I will definitely sometime for sure. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to mute out. I was muted. I'm sorry. (laughs) Cynthia, are you back? Yeah, I'm back. I keep hushing the dogs. They keep barking, so there's probably an animal down there, but I'm not going to worry about it. But Proto, is that the place of plant medicine? Mayor, would you like to take that one and run with it? Um, it's, uh, let me see, I think it's 17 or 18 Capricorn. Pluto is a major player because it's squaring Uranus. Is that the place? Yes, yeah, 17 Capricorn. Now, it's retrograde, so what it's telling us is that inwardly we need to come to terms with using plants to heal ourselves. The Bible's big on that. Genesis says there's an herb to cure every illness known to man. And I think it's time, because Mars will be going into natural medicine, and plant medicine is natural. And I do believe that to end tonight's call on this uh, note, because the new moon, which is July the 4th, on a Monday, has Pluto at plant medicine. But tonight, I believe, let me check and make sure that Pluto is at plant medicine tonight even. Let's see if I can find it here. Okay. Come on, Pluto. Where are you, Capricorn? Um... Sometimes this happens to me. It'll be right in front of me. Okay. Hi, Cynthia. I got I got knocked off, but I'm back. Oh, good. Yeah, Pluto is at Plant Medicine tonight, and it's going to be at Plant Medicine wow. uh, for the new moon on July the 4th. Wow. And it's a wow. big, major player with the mass conscious mind. So if you could wow. read 17 Capricorn. <clears throat> okay. And we'll end on that note and get everybody thinking. Mm-hmm. Okay. Except we can share more afterwards, too, if we want to. Can you mute, okay. mute, please? Oh, yeah. Oh, I think I... Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, 17 Capricorn. Arabim, the angels of plant medicine. Beloved angels, Arabim, please be with us all. Beloved, 
We inspire humankind to use the energy of plants to heal spirit, mind, emotions, and body. As above, so below. And laws of analogy show the correspondence of shape, weight, number, color, and astrological considerations to the powerful energies that plants give. True it is, there is an herb to cure every ailment known to humans. Over the ages, we inspired volumes on the miracles of botany. In each culture, wise ones have extensive knowledge in this regard that we have given them. At this time of the Alpha and the Omega, the knowledge and wisdom of all cultures can May, are you there? Did you get knocked off? All right. Uh, I'm going to find it. Cynthia, can you star six? Plant medicine. What was that? All right, I'm going to look through here. Can somebody star six? Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, okay, this is Patty, so I don't know what got bumped. Uh, I think Mayor got bumped. Um, plant medicine, let me look that up. Okay, I will. She may be calling in right now. Okay, let me Did that somebody out. remember what... what uh, Did she give the uh, degree? Let me see, Scorpio. All right. Let me find this. She may be calling in pretty soon. I'm just going through the book right now. Um, Plant. Okay. All plants. I will pick up, but if anybody remembers what degree she gave, Cynthia gave beforehand, um, just star six and come on in. I'm just looking through the Was it 13? 13 what? Well, I don't know that much about it, but I remember her saying a degree of 13. Okay. 13? All right, I'll go through all of them. 13. Plumacy. Visual translation. Hi, I'm back. Hey. Um, what, what yeah, was... Neptune's at 13 Pisces. 13 Pisces. Let me. Major, major player. Okay, let me let me finish up here. I don't know where Mary is. She might have gotten knocked off. Okay. Uh, so I'm looking at 13 Pisces right now. Muchas gracias. Um, thank you for coming in. Um, That's my birthday. <laughs> wow. Wow. March 13th. <laughs> that's why. I, that's why it it stuck out. <laughs> oh, oh, that's cool. All right. Lucky 13. I love it. Uh, Okay. Uh, Well, this was the Angels of Occult Philosophy. What was plant medicine, Cynthia? The plant medicine is Pluto, and Pluto is at uh, 17 Capricorn with Neptune at... um, 17 Capricorn. Yeah. That's what she was reading. Okay. Yeah. There. Okay. All right, let me go there. 17. All right, here we are. Uh, You want me to just start over? Uh, Yeah, it's bears repeating. Uh, Okay, 17 degrees Capricorn. Um, Armabim, the angels of plant medicine, A-R-A-B-I-M. And if Mare comes on, she can take over uh, if she wants. Beloved, 
We inspire humankind to use the energy of plants to heal spirit, mind, emotions, and holy body. As above, so below, and laws of analogy show the correspondence of shape, weight, number, color, and astrological considerations to the powerful energies that plants give. True it is, there is an herb to cure every ailment known to humans. Over the ages, we inspire volumes on the miracles of botany. In each culture, wise ones have extensive knowledge in this regard that we have given them. At this time of the Alpha and the Omega, the knowledge and wisdom of all cultures concerning the healing properties of plants is being brought together and revealed. One of the most basic ancient ancient secrets for better health is to eat plants that grow close to where you live. Because once you have lived in an area for about seven years, whatever plants you need for healing have been attracted by universal consciousness to this area and are growing. For this reason, the greatest care is given to the well-being of native plants that naturally occur. In every area, plants have evolved over millions of years with special and unique energy signatures. Each one has an important gift to offer and is necessary for the healing and well-being of the life forms in the area where it lives. From the prime beginning, we have taught that when a person has lived in one place for a certain time, historically, it's been seven years, but time is speeding up, so it is, it's less now. The healing plants they need that they need can be found growing nearby attracted to the area by universal mind the nature spirits and heavenly hosts in meditation ask for clear unmistakable guidance from your highest self from surrounding nature spirits and from the heavenly hosts to reveal these helpful plants to you ask for clear guidance as to the method best for their use. A plant can be eaten, made into tea, an essence, or inhaled. You can be guided to the best mode, either directly from within or through teachers and books that come your way. Even in cities, developed areas, powerful native healing plants are found. Look carefully. The lowly dandelion is a prime example. Each native plant can be eaten immediately, giving maximum benefit of life force and fresh enzymes. Any kind of grass is the most powerful healing plant and can be washed, put into a blender with water by itself or with lemon juice and honey, and strained to reveal an emerald green elixir. Drinking this mixture is a healing to a human as it is to the animals who eat grass for food or when they are ill. Consider that horses, cows, and other large grazing animals are able to flourish by eating only grasses as the staple source of nutrition in their diet. The enzymes, chlorophyll, and other ingredients in grass nourish, heal, and purify. Even carnivorous animals such as a dog or wolf, a cat or tiger, will eat grass when they are sick. Use only grasses that that have not been fertilized or sprayed with weed killers or poisons. Listen carefully for inner suggestions, for the subtle impulse that guides you outside to look at the plants growing around. Notice which ones attract you and thank them in humility and reverence as you gather them. Then ask for and into into it assistance on their use and preparation. Just as healing and enlightenment is always available from inner realms, so are healing and enlightenment always available from the outer realms. Each organism in the web of life in any area performs a necessary function 
that affects the whole. We inspire people to work with the angelic realm in protecting and restoring all plant life on earth to its natural, perfected state. As this is done, the gifts of plants help heaven naturally manifest on earth according to the original plans. Volumes have been written about this and more will come in the future. Generally, plants fall into five categories corresponding to the plants uh, to the five planes of energy. On the Akashic plane of consciousness permeating all our psychotropic plants, known to shamans as teacher plants, they are catalysts and cause transformation of consciousness from limitation to the infinite. On the spiritual plane of will and intention are trees. They act as antennas, broadcasting energies that heal and align individual will with divine will for the highest good of all. They also purify and absorb negative willpower, transforming it to use for nourishment. By learning, by leaning against a tree and asking it to absorb negative energy, a person experiences healing, and at the same time, they feed the tree. By giving energy such as joy or love to a tree, the energy is amplified. Energies of ceremonies held near trees is picked up, multiplied, and broadcast. The ancients would join their energy with a tree, ride the energy up the branches, and take their consciousness in the spiritual realms. Or they would travel down the root system into the different reality known as the dream time. Tuning to the spirit of an elder tree is the most wonderful technique. An elder tree facilitates expanding one's feelings of empowerment, breaking out of limits into cosmic knowing. This practice is particularly effective while immersed in a beautiful, undisturbed forest where the air has been purified by photosynthesis and the elemental realm flows strongly with feelings of divinity. Different types of trees have varying spiritual qualities. As they age, their presence becomes very powerful, evolving similarly to human spiritual advancement. On the mental plane are flowers. Flowers are mandalas that emit psychic wholeness. By studying the color, shape, and numbers of the parts, each flower's teaching is revealed. Listen to the flower. Imagine you are one with it. Imagine yourself becoming very small and enter the flower as if it were an entire universe. Fill the mind and go within the silence. Be receptive to the infantile of wisdom contained in flowers. Their perfume attunes the mind to original ideas of virtues that brings healing and enlightenment. On the emotional plane are grasses. Different grasses heal different types of emotions. When you seek emotional healing, ask. And we inspire you to find the appropriate grasses and we guide you to either absorb their healing through meditation or perhaps make a tea or an incense. And on the physical plane are herbs and shrubs. Within their vibration lie healing for the physical body, bringing balm to any condition. As it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end and that is 17 degrees Capricorn Arabim the angels of plant medicine and that is where Pluto is retrograde right now and the three outer planets which are Uranus Neptune and Pluto are affecting the mass conscious mind they move slowly. They affect a whole generation. For Pluto to be here right now is saying to people, 
look into the natural fields and woods around you for your medicine. You don't need a prescription. You don't have to pay any money. You simply have to pay attention. Study the ancient scriptures. Study the books. There's lots of books on wild crafting, on herbs. The Anastasia books were big on it. And just, you know, don't spray your lawn and pull out the dandelions. Eat the darn things. Read up on dandelions, what the flowers do, what the leaves do, what the roots do. You'll be amazed what it does. Not only nutrients, but healing properties. It's well known. It's documented. Let's um, let's go back into the Alpha and the Omega. The Alpha is the beginning. The Omega is the end. The Alpha and the Omega are coming together in a circle. The ancient teachings will now become the new teachings. And we will be forever young, even though we'll be very ancient. It's a wonderful, wonderful time, people. And to recap tonight, please, 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 um, fantasize. Have a fantastic vision of the world that you want to live in. Imagine it. Grab your attention back from the news, from your family, from your friends, from everything you've been taught. Grab it back. Grab your attention and focus it on yourself as a pure divine child. And remember who you were as a child. And remember the kind of world that in your heart, as a pure and innocent child, you wanted to live in. You wanted to wake up in the morning and see. Imagine the world that way. And in so doing, you will be doing high magic. You will be fulfilling what we came in to do at this time. We will be making a huge difference. And all it requires is that you set aside some very important time when you can meditate and you can focus and imagine the world that when you were a child you wished the world could be. So on that note, Marianne and and Mayor and all you beautiful people, Pat, and everyone that shared tonight, um, I turn it over to you. Wow. Thank you so much, Cynthia, Mayor, and uh, everyone else. Thank you. What a night. And... uh, I just love getting together with everyone here and uh, the sharing. We did a lot of sharing tonight and a lot of information came through, uh, very important information. And uh, Cynthia, your talk was stellar. And thank you, Mayor. It's good to hear your voice. We love you. We thank you so much for coming tonight. And uh, sweet dreams. Sweet dreams. Good night, everyone. Good night. Looking for healing or a change in your life to help you enjoy it more fully? You might benefit from a galactic energy reading and clearing from Chris Jacobs. Chris will work with you on a soul level to clear unseen negative influences, implants, programs, contracts, and energetic blocks. Chris Jacobs is a gifted energy healer. Contact him today at ChristopherStephenJacobs at gmail.com.